All right, Michael, you want to start us off? Yeah. Um, so this was an experiment with a, I don't know, a real flat looking hollow form. It was a piece that I saw David Nittman make, and I'm pretty sure Cindy made the one that he made had a finial on it and a foot, and it was very small, almost like an ornament. And I'm pretty sure Cindy did the finial on the foot, but I love the style of the piece and I loved the pattern. So this is a straight up ripoff of his pattern. So I'll call it a, a, a tribute to. It was just one of those things that you couldn't not re try to recreate. So that, I think it looks, that's cool, but I think the top is just what oh, I love yeah. about it. Awesome, that is beautiful. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> Thanks. So that's 10 and a half, four inches, four and a half tall. I think the one he did was, pro it looked like it was probably four inches wide by an inch and a half, two inches tall, something like that. Now, when you say you just copied his pattern, did you just take it from a photo and count it off and figure it out, or did you get the pattern? Yeah, the, the only picture I could find, and it wasn't like I was looking for it, I just was looking at David Nippman's photos, or photos with that were associated to him on Google, and I saw, and it's just a side shot, but what's based on the demo we did last month, what was interesting is I had to deconstruct it. So I'm looking at this photo, I'm blowing it up as, as big as I can on my phone, and I'm trying to count the beads and then figure out what the pattern was and, you know, what his repeat pattern was. And, and I finally got it figured out, and uh, it was worth the effort. I like, I like the color combinations. I like what he did with the, the pattern. Um, I just really like that piece a lot. When you play oh, with can't patterns take credit like, for it. Sorry. When you play with patterns like that, do you do it on paper? Do you do it on a computer? I'm just curious. I do it a lot of times I would do it on paper on that on the graph paper I told you guys about but a buddy of mine named Jim Marks if you guys follow him on Instagram you know I was telling him about the polar graph paper and then he figured out you could import it into Photoshop because it's a PDF and then I don't want to get too technical but you flatten the image and I'll put a white background instead of transparent blah blah and then I just use the paint bucket and I can color the squares quickly and then decide if I don't like it I just alt z you know right. so it's it saved me a lot in ink um but same principle cool. those uh, michael those two rings on the inside there those are larger than the than the uh the other rings right with the for the basco illusion correct they're actually the same size they are I was yep. one. I, I, they look like they're bigger, and I thought, well, being black, I can see the white one, you know, would be, but the black one looks like it's larger as well. That's a three sixteenth um, beading tool on both of them. It wow. may look larger because it's taller, like it's sitting, it's sitting a little proud with the vessel. Uh huh. Uh -huh. But it's a, it's, it's the three sixteenth. Wow. Like that, the, the contrast of the color is probably offset yeah. too. Well, I like I like the two rings like that. Anyway, you know the being the two different, you know, co the contrast between the, yeah. the two rings themselves, but also the contrast with that and the the rest of the piece. So it's pretty cool. And then I've been taking India ink and coating the inside of the, so, you know, I I do them as segmented pieces. I turn the top and I turn the bottom, mm. and then I marry the two instead of trying to hollow out a segmented piece. Um, <clears throat> but before I marry them, I paint the inside with uh, any ink and paint it black. I don't know. I just think it looks it makes it look more. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, it looks nice. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I should paint it a different color. To start it, with. it hides all the defects inside too, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to see that big catch I had with, you know, with the scraper. Um, this is actually almost the same pattern. It's just a variation of it. It doesn't have the interior. In the previous one, there's almost like a, a, a little cross on the inside, on the inside of a diamond. And on this one, see that blue cross on the very inside of the diamond pattern? Yeah. yeah. I just I just eliminated it from this one and didn't use blue at all. And it's the same pattern. Hmm. No, my, my brother, as, I, as I started playing around with this, I noticed that you know your different shapes, the curvature of the bowl, whether it's on a uh, hollow form, it changes patterns just just in, in it's insane how it changes. Yeah. Um, 
doesn't it? So when I when we did the the demo and I mentioned that, it does it make more sense now? Because I think yeah. it's hard to explain until you do it, and then you realize that oh, it's going to stretch here and it's going to be deformed there, and yep. Yeah, it does. I tried to do um, this week. I tried to do a houndstooth digital pattern, and I thought, well, that would be kind of cool. But it, because of any type of curvature at all, it looks like crap. Just FYI, if anybody wants to try it. <laughs> um, so yeah, this was a solid maple. Came off of a, a slab of maple from Clink Spores. And uh, same pattern, just variation. Yeah, I like it. Very nice. I Mike, you have your pieces at an, art, at an art store somewhere. What yeah, do they sell for? So it depends on the pieces. Most, like I have, you know, that big peacock one I did a while back. Mm -hmm. I slapped like a $2,500 price tag on that just because it took me forever to make. And if somebody wants to buy it, great. If they don't, I'm fine with that too. That one obviously has not sold. Um, the other ones they've been selling anywhere from 350 for small pieces to 750 for a, a decent sized platter. And roughly how many have you sold of these so I've, I've had the stuff in that gallery since the first or the end of november and seven pieces of sold wow pretty good yeah not and, bad and do you know who the customers are typically what kind of uh, people so that it's a whole you know i don't want to get too long-winded that gallery it's just a really cool town that they're trying to revitalize a guy that's got a lot of money came in and dumped it into the town and he's invested in a, an art center and uh, a new school and all this kind of stuff. And part of what he invested in was their gallery. It's a really small, almost forgotten or dilapidated town. So when you're driving into it, you're thinking, what is going on here? But uh, in that area, I guess it pulls from Lake Gaston. So people were driving 45 minutes and the food we went ate last weekend at the uh at the bistro that's next to the gallery and i'm not joking guys it was five star it was just incredible the chef came out it was one of the best meals i've ever had and one of the best experiences in dining i've ever had so they're pulling people from lake gas and i think that's where that money's coming from mm. thank you nice. what town is this in it's in a town called littleton uh -huh. If you guys are curious, just because of the cool story, look up Littleton and the Fitz Foundation, F-I-T-Z, and you can hear about what Frank or Mr. Fitz and his wife are doing for that community, because that's where he was raised. He went and made millions of dollars and then came back and he's reinvesting in the community. It's really a cool story. Hmm. Okay, Ron. Oh, well, about your first piece. of all, uh, thank you for putting me after Michael's work here for my first attempt. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at this already, Ron, you know, when they, when they got posted, and I'm, I'm in love with it. I love the colors. It's nice. I love the combos. It looks cool. Really so nice. Thank you. It was, uh, again, really the first time uh, using the E-Way tools. I went out and, uh, you know, Michael, basically uh, dumped your resource list in the Amazon and other places and, and went whole hog on it. Um, so I'm cool. officially down that rabbit hole. Um, but first piece, it was uh, literally a piece of maple butcher block I had uh, from an old friend and um, threw it on. Just wanted to do an embellishment on a, on a shallow bowl platter, whatever you want to call it, rim. Um, it's, uh, you know, not a lot of it's you know, five beads and uh, 36 spokes or, or whatever, but, um, you know, that, and I just stayed with kind of fall colors on the, on the uh, favorite pastel markers. I love those. I love the color combination. That, my wife would be, her first words out of her mouth or she saw that would be mine. That's what she always says when, when it's her colors. <laughs> so, but it was fun, uh, fun experience just you know, gathering everything, setting it up, getting, you know, built the uh, platforms and, you know, different things like that. And I, I did go with the uh, Alice Sam <coughs> indexing wheel and pin in that, which I think um, was a lot easier than using the built-in index here on my lathe. Yeah. That's cool. I'm really happy you tried. Did you, did you enjoy it? 
I did actually, yeah. Um, the next piece I did took a lot longer, but I, I, you know, found myself, um, you know, just getting lost in the, you know, the burning and the coloring and listening to music and having a few adult beverages and yeah. <laughs> there you go. Now uh, this was a base here that I did. It's um, it's thirty two beads and thirty six spokes as well. Um, when I showed a family member this thing, they asked, wow, how big is that? And I said, well, it's it's about 24 inches. I was using inch beading tools and uh, it's like, <laughs> but no, it's, it's done with the 3 16th uh, tool as well. <clears throat> when I just, you know, the pattern is just kind of winging it on paper and putting it on the face. Does it make your brain start thinking about like, do you have like these epiphanies? Like, oh, that would be a cool pattern, you know? Yeah, yeah. I I did the you know printed off a bunch of uh, polar graphs and different things, and um, I like your idea with Photoshop because I don't know how many times I'd start coloring something and crumple it up yep. and got to start over again rather than <clears throat> yep. trying to erase in that. So I might have to look into that. But you know, I never I, um, segmenting, but there are software tools that folks have written to plan out and visualize segments. I'm wondering if that might be a tool yes. for you guys to play with patterns and see how they would look on the curve. They do have one that's dedicated to basket illusion. Oh. I am just not smart enough to figure it out because every time I plug in my spokes and all that stuff, and then I tell it the colors and then it renders it, it's messed up. And I, so I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but they do have a dedicated software tool to do it. You know, I remember reading about that before someplace that they had the tool for that. Uh, I remember what, who, who I've used those before, and it uh, it seems to work pretty good for me. It just you even can put the bowl on your lathe. It's mm. uh, pretty crazy that way, but um, it's obviously made for segments. But I was able to uh, uh, put a pattern on the bowl assuming it was segments when it really was the uh, basket illusion. Hmm. Yeah. He's, um, Ron, I, I love sorry, this, Ron, and I, you have me at Pink Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, that's, uh, you know, it, just by the way, if you want to see a really good tribute band called Brit Floyd, they make their way to Deepak, you know, every couple of years or so. I'm down worth going um but my one of the things that you know stuck out that i learned so i did not um i had some of the um the only place i could get the beading tips fast enough for me was i, I think i got them at cling spore and they were the straight prong and you are absolutely right if you bend that um, and i did it by accident it got hot and pressing too hard and it, it bent the thing you know 30 40 degrees and it changed how e much easier it is to get that straight line and see you know the, the actual burn line rather than trying to look around the whole, the whole yeah but if it was all freehand um you know it's just repetitive you know process that one thing i would like to get some advice on um so I've, i haven't done any segmenting yet but i built my wedgie sled i've 3d printed my wedges and everything like that <laughs> start you know trying to do you know bigger hollow forms and stuff like that um what are you guys using to actually glue them together, Ned? And I saw um, somewhere that there was discussion about sanding each piece or not in the tools and tips trick. I, I was in and out of that meeting and only caught a little bit of that. Any advice? I, mean, I think it was, it was Bob that did yeah, the, the sanding I, for the I've segment. got the little uh, uh, jig that I made. Um, actually, if, if you're interested in it, uh, I went back and looked and it was... Uh, Malcolm Tibbet. Malcolm. Sounds right. Tib yeah, Tibbet uh, is, a, is a segmenter. And he had a, a book and he had a whole series of uh, photographs and whatnot of jigs that he used. And I picked that up from him. So that's a source for you. Um, okay. Or I could take some pictures of it and, and send it to you if you want. Well, I'll definitely check out that if um, and I'll start with the book in that. That way I got it. Um, I have I'm a suggestion using... about segmenting, but it's just one. It's my only one. <laughs> don't. It's don't. 
Don't. <laughs> hey, Ron. Yeah. Ron, are you on Instagram? Uh, no, but I can be. <laughs> I was going to say. Oh, oh actually, I am, but I never use it. Um, All right. Well, I've, I've developed a, or... <clears throat> I read about a very much different technique for segmenting that I've tried a few times. Works real well. <clears throat> Turns out when you put those clamps on the piece, the real objective is just to squeeze the excess glue out. You don't have to put hundreds of pounds of pressure on to get a good glue joint. So you, you take your segments and glue them together in pairs, two at a time. Let those sit about 10 minutes. Glue those together, you know, two at a time, and keep it up until you've got an arc, 180 degrees. Let that sit overnight, then press it up against your disc sander, get those edges nice and flat, and 280 degree pieces will glue together. And any mistakes you've made all the way around, you take care of. I've right. done that three different times now, works like a charm. I use that method all the time, Jeffrey. That's, that, that's a good method to do. You get a good fit all the way around. <laughs> Oh yeah, programs that I was mentioning were uh, Woodturner Pro, Lamination Pro, and Segment Pro. If you uh, Google those, you'll find the programs. But I took the course uh, at Woodcraft with Bob George, and uh, he mentioned that he always uses um, Pipe Bond One because he uses a surface sander, a thickness sander, and he can take his belts if he uses that uh, wood bond one and soak them in water and all the glue comes off and he can keep using the belts, which I thought was pretty cool. But uh, I, I still, I don't use anything be below wood bond two just because I want it to be waterproof. But um, that made sense to me using the wood bond one on the waterproof. It also has the fastest bond. Um, I know at the Raleigh Symposium, they were showing a system where you could stick it and count to 15 and then go to the next segment, turning it around and everything. So uh, wood bond one works pretty good with those. But Wood Turner Pro, Lamination Pro, and Segment Pro are three programs that work together to plan and shape those those vessels. The, okay, Bob, you want to carry us on? Yeah, if, if you could advance that one, Norm, I'd appreciate it. But this is this is where I started out. I, I what I decided to do was to make some little five and six inch uh, blanks just to play around with. And so the top one there was my first attempt. That was uh, cherry. And uh, it was more or less to try to learn how to use that uh, D-Way tool. And I learned very quickly as I started to get tear out, which you can see on the bottom on the left, um, I was holding the, uh, the tool in the wrong orientation. So, uh, it was kind of an exercise in learning how to use the tools and whatnot. But uh, the bottom one there was maple, and I think I got the beads a little bit better. I also started with uh, 30 spokes uh, and as many circles as I could get on there because I was just kind of winging it. And I just discovered very quickly that you're pretty limited in the kind of design that you can do uh, with fewer spokes. So the more spokes you have, uh, you can get more creative with your designs. And I, and Michael, you could probably answer this question for you. It seems to me in some of the work I've seen, uh, people have actually taken a spoke and subdivided the spoke into more cells so that you can get finer designs within one spoke. That, yeah, there's that a guy named Carl, I don't remember his last name on Instagram and part of his pattern is that subdivision. So he'll, yeah. he won't color those, but he'll subdivide and, and that'll become part of his pattern even though it's just the burn marks. It looks really cool. Yeah, yeah. So I, I thought I'd just kind of play around with that on paper to see what, what I can 
what I could come up with. But anyway, these two were my my first two trials. I've got several more that I've got cut out and working on. Uh, and I guess Norm, if you can go back one. This is the one that I'm just working on right now. I'm uh, getting ready to start coloring it. And that one, when you see that design on a flat piece of graph paper, it doesn't look anything like that that you see there on the uh, polar graph. Mm. Yeah. It's really strange. But this one, I went to, to 60 spokes and you can see that you can get a lot more, where well, there's a lot more detail, you get a lot more design area in that. So uh, I can see where you, as you get bigger pieces and you start working your way up, you're gonna have a lot more versatility in your designing and whatnot. And that repeat on that, that wove pattern, it's like, it's six beads, isn't it? On this one here? Yeah. Uh, I haven't marked I, it. What is it. I think it's like six down, six over, six down, six over. Something I like think it's that. what it equates yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. That's going to look really good. I don't know really why good. or how I did that. When I took a picture of that thing and, and the paper, that's not, the, the picture I took, the paper wasn't reversed. I don't oh. quite understand how that happened, but anyway. <laughs> I was wondering, like you're shooting in the mirror now? Yeah. <laughs> I, I just laid it in the in the booth there and I took a picture of it when I started to put it together. I go, how the heck did that happen? <laughs> anyway, that is I weird. can't flip the image because your top text is going the right way. I know. Right? I couldn't do anything with it. <laughs> Did you did you enjoy it though, Bob? Was it I'm enjoyable? Or was it... I, I, Michael, you have sent me down the rabbit hole. I'm telling you, I've got a folder. I got every time I start one of these things, I think, oh, it, like you said, wonder if I change that design or if I change this shape, or what it's going to look like. So yeah, I got uh, uh, a lot of work I can do uh, with this. This is this has been something I've been wanting to do, and now that you got me started on it, uh, I'm afraid I'm lost. You're welcome, and I'm, I'm happy for you. This is this all is, I know is I spend way too much time looking at numbers all day to do this at night. <laughs> it's, it's, you gotta try it. It's very soothing. You, you know, like you put some music. This is good winter work. News, TV, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Bob, I you? got I'm, I've got a vessel that I'm working on, segmented vessel that I'm gonna uh, do uh, hopefully next. We'll see what happens, but. Anyway. So that uh, should you back back up again for a second, uh, Norm, to that yeah that image there. So the one on the lower left there, Bob, that reminds me of the TV screens, you know, that they yes. used to go blank. <laughs> <laughs> right, they so would like, broadcast. That's where that. that came from. One night I was sitting there trying to figure this out. <laughs> All of a sudden, that's something else. Yeah, it was the, right. the American Indian was on there with that the pattern in the background. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. a little closer yeah. to the radioactive background. Showing yeah. our age. Just um, just real quick, quick, quick sidebar on that. Michael, when you were mentioning the fact that uh, uh, you had used uh, David Nittman's pattern, it made me think of something that I was looking at all these different uh, uh, pieces. And Harvey, Harvey Meyer, who does a lot of this, he puts on all of his pieces, do not copy my patterns. And I thought, well, okay, fine. Well, I got to looking at American Indian pottery. Yeah. Where do you think he got his stuff from? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. not all original. <laughs> no, it's they're all repeats. Yeah. I, I've been trying to not do that. Yeah. Hey, Bob, sorry, just a quick question. Um, yes. On that bowl, are, are, are you freehanding, free, freehand burning each of these spokes, or were you using a jig and a platform type thing to do that? Because they look really smooth and straight. I, I just, I, I actually penciled them out with my indexing jig, and then I go, I use my uh, burner and just do them by hand. Yeah, really good. So well, I've got, uh, I've got that, uh, I've got a little. Uh, jig that I can do it on there, but I just hate sitting out in the shop when it's cold yeah. doing it. So I bring them in the house and do it and it uh, works out fine. I'm impressed with what you guys were able to do with uh, from Michael's demo. So great, great job. Me too. I love it. I'm just, I'm thrilled that you guys tried it and that you enjoyed it. That, yeah. Well, well, just well. the fact that one person tried it was exciting and I'm, I'm stoked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really enjoy it. There's a lot more to learn, around. obviously. So, Jeff, tell tell us about your piece here. Um, without telling a very long story, um, we helped Tina take down some trees in her yard, 
One of them was a Holly. Um, I say of it. Um, her favorite color is blue. She likes birds. So I did a winged bowl. I actually got the edges fairly consistent. And then a friend painted a couple of blue birds on it for me. Nice. Um, I took the piece, let it dry, turned it, put a coat, a couple of two coats of shellac on it and sanded it down. Um, then it was painted with watercolor, um, gave lady a test piece, and I was able to shoot some, some rattle can lacquer on the test piece without messing up the watercolor. So that's got uh, three coats of rattle can over the top of the, the, uh, the paint. Very cool. Yeah. I like the design. Um, I actually got the ball through fairly well and got a reasonably uniform thickness and kept the uh, the bark on it. Good job. And no cracks. No yeah. cracks. And no blackness. Um, yeah. When I got the piece of wood home, I put some uh, fungicide on it that uh, a colleague in the paint business gave me. So I wasn't particularly worried about it uh, turning black. Few things more perfect than a winged bowl with two birds on it. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> um, nice job. Very nice. Thank you. Really nice, Jeff. Thank you. Stefan, that brings us to you. Wow. Nice. Yes, uh, this is American Holly spalted, which I got three years ago in Raleigh. It was very plain at that time, boring, completely uniform, and I didn't do anything with it. I left it in front of the garage. I also ran out of time to do anything with it. Um, and I was cleaning up in front of the garage because my wife wanted everything cleared away. And I saw that this American Holly had spotted beautifully. It has also cracked, so the big pieces I had were not useful, but I was able to cut away some smaller pieces. So just almost by itself, uh, once I, I tried to do a bigger piece, I saw the crack, I turned more stuff away and I decided I'd just make a few pieces here, smaller pieces. And that's what this is. Um, it is, I did not um, use any finish initially because I was afraid it would turn yellow because it's very dry and it sucks up, um, would suck up finish. So then I used the mini wax, um, what is it called? Um, that's just a superficial finish. It does not go into the wood. You said you guys, polycrylic? Polycrylic is what you have. Yes, that, that's correct. You guys, one of you had recommended that in the past. Um, and that's what this is. I liked the idea, I've had this for a while, to use some weathered old uh, wood as a base. Um, you know, you're getting closer now. Underneath is... Yeah, the wood, um, which somebody in, in, her, in her basement, and I don't know what that wood is. The other side that you saw where the piece is standing on is, is just as it came, and I like this weathered look right here. The saw the marks? Bottom, the saw marks and also this grayishness and has some whitish, it's not uniformly colored. You don't see what kind of wood it is. It just looks old historic. But I did sand away the bottom, I planed the bottom and I sanded away and the sides to show what kind of wood it is because it's very nice wood. But I don't know what that is. If somebody can make any guess, I would be thankful to you. Um, it was a leftover from somebody who built a kitchen um, um, table or so. So it could be some African wood, wangi or Bocote, I don't know. What's uh, the density? What's, What's the that? density? How heavy is it? Is it like is it, really it, dense? Yeah, it's very dense. Like, does it feel like you're picking up, a, a, you know, a big old bag of concrete? Um, yeah, sort of. Mm -hmm. There's a, a wood, it starts with a D. Uh, I made a pepper mill out of it, and I swear it could be used to like beat seals with or things like a monster. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I have to Thanks look it up. Image. I might message you. <laughs> I'll message you, Steve, and, uh, okay. and, and and see because 
I've used it and it's the same coloration, same pattern. I have to go back and look and see what it was, but it was like really dense. And aside Would from look. that, the pieces you turned are phenomenal. That the thickness of those rims, the shape, the form, I'm like, a, oh. I, I'm blown away. I think it's awesome. I'll uh, tell you what I really like is that little shallow bowl down there, the way that uh, uh, pattern has developed in there. It almost looks like there's a residue of popcorn left in the bowl or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's cool. Is that an end grain bowl, I mean, that shallow one? Is it what, please? Is that end grain? Yes, it's end grain. You're correct. Wow. I'm telling you, each of these on their own, it would be like, oh, that's really impressive. But together, though, I mean, it's, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Beautiful presentation. Well, thank you very much. I was very happy with it, too, I must say. And um, just as a final comment on that, in our neighborhood 10 days ago, a cherry tree started to blossom. Uh, so I've put this uh, set of, not this one, the previous ones, the American Holly, uh, on my Instagram account with a cherry um, blossom um, um, branches in it, which looks very nice. Um, anyway, very cool. thanks for your comments. That's beautiful. Beautiful work, Stefan. Thank cherry, you. Cherry blossoms last week, snow this week. Yeah. Yes, it's incredible. <laughs> if you go to the other, to the second um, image first, please. Um, so this is a piece of red tip, one of the bushes or the shrubs, um, which don't get all that big. I got this piece in Durham, the wood, um, and just turned it into this vase here, which I put on a base of curly willow. The curly willow has a lot of character. I have turned some balls of it. And I thought the color combination was nice. I've really liked the red tip. It has a lot of different reddish, brownish tones to it. Um, unfortunately, it was cracked. And if you go to the previous image, um, initially I was very disappointed, but then I used the technique that I've learned here in the club of using Indian rosewood dust with CA glue, and I put it in there. And I was actually surprised in, and maybe it doesn't quite show on this picture, but in, in real life and maybe even here, it gives it actually structure. It does not look like a defect, but rather, oh yeah, it almost enhances it with some structure. So I've liked it. Yeah, a lot of character in that, but it, then it blends in color-wise very well. That, and the proportions, the way those cracks, I don't know. I, it's, I think it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, the cracks are a, a little bit, some of them are, are kind of uh, at an angle. You know, they're like uh, twisting around yeah. the piece, which really uh, doesn't take away from the piece for sure. It adds to it. Yeah. In, in the middle down by your thumb there, it is, that looks like a little spalting on the right and left. Is it it does. It, okay. Uh, and yeah, it's a good observation. I'm not sure it is faulting or may, maybe I've just filled it in. I look at it again. It has been a nice lesson and we don't have any newcomers in the club, it seems, at least on this call, but it's something I'm learning. Initially, I wanted to turn perfect pieces that were not cracked or didn't have any bark inclusions. And over time, um, bark inclusions have become part of the pieces that are nice and give it character. And here with this piece for the first time, I realized, or for the second time, I had seen that in another piece last year, uh, cracks can also enhance the piece. It's not necessarily that you have to throw it away, which is a good lesson to learn. Yeah. yeah. I think the imperfections, in all honesty, is what makes a piece sometimes. Yeah. That's my opinion. I'm not saying it's right, but I agree. I think sometimes it's the imperfections that make it 100% unique. There's none other like it. You're not going to get it at TJ Maxx, and it and it just yeah. makes it interesting. You love my last piece. I had a lot of imperfections. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does not apply to every crack. So what I personally don't like is when you have a piece of, for example, oak, and you still have the pith in it, and you have the cracks that come from the pith center. It's just yeah. so, I, I just don't like that one. This is more unexpected, not as regular or homogeneous. Nice. Norm, oh, we have a minute. Can, can we go back to that mystery piece of wood for uh, Stefan? 
Yeah, the base. That piece of wood that you didn't know what it was. No, there would be three back. One more. Yeah. Yep. Okay. This is a, a Bobinga uh, rolling pin that I made. I don't know if you can see this or not, but it, it's pretty similar. So I will look that up. That Bobinga could well doesn't be. have the open pores like that, though. That's because I've worked with Bubinga. It could but be. Michael, you were also thinking about a wood with B. Maybe you were thinking about Bubinga. I actually just messaged it to you. I'm wondering if it's Brazilian coffee wood. <laughs> it, it looks a lot like Brazilian coffee wood now that you mention it, because I've used a few pieces of it and that kind of looks it. Yeah, that's what, I just was going through my old post to find it. And that's what it was. That's what it reminded me of. And it was super <laughs> dense. I mean, it was like, I, it was like concrete. It was crazy. Amen, brother. Thank you, guys. Jerry. Okay, simple pieces. Um, cut down some shrubs in the back. After I tripped over it a couple of times, I dug up this root ball and threw it under the deck. And about a year later, I decided I would turn something out of it, kind of on spur of the moment. And if you talk about uh, imperfections and bark and stuff, that has plenty of it. But it has kind of some cool grain because mm -hmm. it is kind of a root ball or was a root ball. And so it's about that. six inches high and three inches in diameter. And I think the, the shrubs called boxwood or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just something simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Just because it's because it's not I me mean, it is perfect, but it's not perfect. And that's what makes it perfect. I know that sounds really stupid, but. Yeah, it, it has some really nice um, sheen to it and stuff. The, uh, what do you call that? Forgot the term now. Chinoyance? Yeah, chatoyance. Sh chatoyance. Oh, that was me, Norman. I'm, I'm chinoying. <laughs> yeah, chatoyance. I took French in, in high school. I should remember that, right? Cat's eye. Chatoyance. Yeah. So yeah, that, so that's it, just a couple views. Very simple, and I drilled it for a test tube so you can throw a, a test tube in there if you wanna do it, but just a little weed pot. I love it. Very nice. Thank you. And the proportions, I mean, that's the thing too. It can have the imperfections, but if the proportions weren't right, it wouldn't look cool. It's, the, it's that general, that curve, the thinness of the, the neck, in proportion to the body, or what I'll call the butt, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you just want to pick it up like and rotate in your hand. Yeah, it's that feminine form. Okay, and then um, this is uh, some heavily spalted ash, and it's about an eight-inch bowl, three and a half inches deep. Um, the the wall thickness is about three-eighths of an inch. I left it a little thicker, um, but uh, it got it got pretty heavily spalted just sitting under my deck. That looks borderline punky. Was it punky at all? Um, you know, just a little bit. I had a little bit of trouble on the end grain on the inside. The outside cleaned up really nice. Um, the, the end grain on the inside you can't see it in this photo, but I, I had trouble. I probably have a, a few little uh, um, imperfections in the end grain on the inside. But it, yeah, I have some. I have some maple that's really, really punky. I need to probably think about stabilizing that. But this, I don't know. It's just I, I cut. I cut logs in half and let them sit under my deck. And it surprised me how fast it got this spalted. I like that rim oh, tree cool. too. Yeah, yeah I want to do something a little different with the rim. So I just kind of made it, uh, you know, dished out a little bit to give it some texture or something other than just flat. 
Mm -hmm. That's nice. It's a nice ash. Yeah, thank you. Put your language out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was waiting to see if you'd pick up on it. I love it. I think well, that's faulting. Yeah, that's faulting the way it, uh, it's just cool. It looks great. It's beautiful. Yeah. I like the rim too. It's in a very interesting uh, shape to it. Thank you. Ah. Ray, are you with us? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is a piece that I actually saw the shape on an eBay auction site, and they were two of them listed as uh, Rudy Solnik candlesticks from uh, 1960s. Mm -hmm. And what kind of got me about it was, how did he do that? Uh, so the last day of class that we had at ACC, uh, I actually had just a glue up of a couple of boards and kind of went after the shape and, and figured out how, where was, you know, when was that lateral or angular cut made uh, the pieces that, these are small. I mean, I was really messing around with scrap stuff that was laying around the, I think the Asalnik pieces might be five or six inches tall and, and maybe three, three and a half. These are really, really small. I don't know if I have the two of them in there, but this is, I think this is a piece of sycamore that was a cutoff yeah, uh, that, from a hole. That looks like sycamore right there. Yeah, that's what yeah. caught my eye too when I saw that, and it and it's got just water damage or something at the bottom. I just you know tried to get the, get it in there. When the pieces are bigger, um, which I haven't been able to copy yet or to reproduce, the top curves in. Um, so in addition to the 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 angle cut, the the top narrows down. Um, and it has kind of a, a hooded effect, which I haven't quite gotten yet because I haven't figured out how to you know, do that. But I, I just need to work with a little bit bigger wood. You can see these are pretty small. That's one of those battery operated candle things in there. <clears throat> um, so it's just mostly turning? messing with the shape. I'm sorry? You cut that angle before turning or afterwards? I did. Um, so far that's... That's what I've done. Um, I did try one where I hollowed it first and then made the cut and I found I couldn't keep the rim consistent. Um, right, mm. no feedback. When it's spinning and it's already cut, you can actually see the, mm. the rim. Yeah. Uh, so, and of course I was using a, a, a hollow, uh, what do you call it? A, cup cutter and uh i got some deep lines in there that i couldn't sand out so but like i said this is more of a kind of a test the concept and see how they would come out it's cool i wonder if you my brain's going on this one if you cut that angle and then took it to um like a sander but the drum i don't know what it's called um Oh, like, yeah, the, like a spindle oscillating sander. disc. Yeah, yeah spindle oscillator. sander, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. with the big with the big spindle on it, so it's it's cupped. You know what I mean? Versus just being a straight line. I wonder if that would give you that hooded effect. Well, I cut those on a bandsaw, and you can do you can kind of recreate that on the bandsaw too. Yeah. So that would be wow. instead of just making a straight cut, I was going to scribe an arc on one of them and see you know what that did to it too. You, you can follow it, that like on there. A thousand times easier than what I was trying to explain. That was perfect. I think yeah, it's very I've, cool. I've been on and off a couple times taking it on and off because it's easier to make the cut on the bandsaw when it's square. But once you make the cut, you kind of Safer lose a too. center point. Um, yeah. so I usually I I turn the the um tenon um and then I drill my my starting hole and I drill the Faulkner bit down to where I want the, uh, the piece to fit on the bottom, which also then gives me a, another spot to put the center. 
So then I take it off while it's still square and make that cut. And then I put it back on and then do the rounding. The, the problem that I have there that I haven't figured out yet is, you know, once you make the cut, it determines how, how much of a curve you can have on the top. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you're limited if you cut it too much to the edge, you're not going to get kind of a hooding effect. If you cut it more towards the center, you know, and of course, the, the other thing that about anything that with candles, uh, you know, I give them away with the electric ones because I worry about somebody putting real, real candles in small pieces of wood that are fairly thin. Um, but I, I was thinking about milk paint on the inside. I actually sent an email off to the company that makes a big art milk paint thing to see if they thought milk paint was fire retardant. And, uh, and I was thinking about the inside perhaps being a, a milk paint, but they wouldn't, uh, obviously they wouldn't say that it was, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think if they're better paint, you'd have it, it'd be okay. You know, if somebody stuck a real tea light in there, tea candle in there, I, I just worry about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, just get some header paint. And this piece I'm, I made as a Christmas gift for my grandson's girlfriend. Um, this is plum. And I um, was lucky enough to get some nice pieces of plum. It's about eight inches across. It's right at the base of the, it was the very base of the plum tree that my buddy cut down. Um, and it's been laying out in the garage for a couple of years. And, I, and this one, I just wanted to get the, the uh, potpourri pewter insert floating a little bit. Um, they're not always round. And when you kind of inset them, they don't always sit right. And, uh, and they either wobble or they're tight or they're tight on one side and not, and, then you, and, and so it just bothered me a little bit and I was trying to get it to sit up a bit. So that's a hollow form of course, because it is actually a, a potpourri bowl. It's about eight inches and about four, three and a half, four inches tall. And that's plum. I you don't see plum that much. So that was kind of the interesting part. And this was before I bought my little light box. So it was just the picture on the uh on the counter, kitchen counter. Um glad you mentioned sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say being a fruit tree, the fact that it didn't crack is cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, Since plum you, usually cracks a lot. Yeah. Since you mentioned quite, photography, I wanted to point out, I really appreciate you guys putting effort into making the photos smaller. Some of you have gone way too far. These photos were about 50K, which is why as I zoom in, we can't see any detail on them. Okay. I'll so they don't the need to be step. that small. We just want them under a megabyte. These are coming in under 100K. Okay. I'm going to send Norm a thumbnail next time and say, go yeah. get him, Tiger. <laughs> This was this was the smallest. You're right. This was the smallest size available. So I'll go up the next size yeah, next time. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I just, yeah. You get it. It's that the small. Not looking like pixelated pixels. Yeah. <laughs> and let me get this back down the size. Ted. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. This is. Um, I have a friend that. Uh, she's an artist and her daughter's an artist and I help her out with different, different projects. And she called me one day and said, Hey, I got a mimosa tree that we took down. Do you want, you want the wood? And I said, well, I don't have any idea. I've never worked with mimosa. And I haven't seen anybody else pieces out of mimosa. I said, so yeah, I'll, I'll take it and I'll give it a try. So, um, so I did. And about halfway through it, I almost threw it out because it's really tough wood to turn. It's uh, very stringy and it's hard to get a, a clean cut on it. But what I liked about it and, uh, was the, the grain pattern in it. You can see that it, it, it goes back and forth between dark and light. And you know, normally like the sap wood will be light on the outside and the darker wood on the inside, but this alternates back and forth in the center of it. Some of it's even, much lighter than the outside is of the wood. So it made a really cool pattern in it and um so i made uh a couple pieces out of it and i thought i'd share that with you and, if, and ask the question if anybody else has ever turned any mimosa and what was their experience with it 
Hey, I'm Ted, good. you ought to you ought to get hold of Eric uh, and and tell him you come up with a way to make an elastic bowl with with a natural spiral in it. Can he tell you how he did it? I've got a few pieces of mimosa that have been drying for ten years now, and I haven't gotten around to turning them. Was this dry when you worked with it, Ted? It was it was semi dry. The tree was dead or near dead. And actually this, this box right here that I turned, I just turned this the other day and it was, it was dry when I turned it. The next piece was a little bit green when I first turned it, but uh, this piece here um, was more, more green uh, when I turned it. But uh, you can see the, the, the different grain color, I guess the colorness of the grain you know, alternates quite a bit. And, uh, and if you look down here towards the, where it comes dead, tapers down towards the bottom, you can see how that effect, uh, you know, has on, on the piece. So I thought it was pretty cool. This one I took Excellent. a picture of because it reminded me of an alien, you know, like two eyeballs looking at you, uh, <laughs> alien. So I thought that was kind of cool. I, I love the uh, embellishing you did on the top. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to do something a little bit different on the top of it. And so I kind of experimented. I carved out the side pieces. And then after I did that, the top, the very top of it just didn't didn't fit. I was trying to figure out, well, should I put a ring in there or something? Or So then I decided to do the burning on the top with a, a little round burn tool and um, little dots. And uh, it came out pretty good, I think. Is this related cool. to monkey pod mimosa? I don't really know, I, I, quite honestly. I know I've heard of monkey pod. I think someone else had something they made out of monkey pod here before, but I, I don't, I'm not familiar with it myself. In monkey pod, a little bit darker color wood. It, it seemed to have the same kind of char characteristics around yeah. the uh, eyes, that's why. I like well, the piece, Ted. The, the one thing I, I just got to comment on because it keeps sh shouting at me, the foot looks too big to me. Maybe others disagree, but it just it's a little yeah. too big for my eye. Yeah, it uh, it looks a little bit big there. Uh, it doesn't look as as much uh, on the you know in reality, I guess whatever. But I made that purposely that way because I make a lot of them where they have a small base to it. But I wanted to bring that pattern out that's in that Rain. green on the yeah. bottom so i i left it big and also you know all these pieces you make these hollow forms are not that stable you know the the foot is so small on them um so this is a made it very stable piece so for those two reasons i i, I made the left the foot a little bit bigger than you would normally do on it so but ted I, I, go ahead it's, Stephen. it's a, the mimosa tree is the same as the silk tree right um it's I don't know. It, it is so. Okay. I I've turned it once. It was one of my first pieces that I turned because Mike Smith had brought some um, silk tree or mimosa from Florida. And I usually don't buy what I bought it from him, and it actually has become or has been for years now the favorite bowl in my household that my oh, family cool. has. It has a very different appearance, though I must say. So yeah. I'm puzzled. My wood looks very different to yours. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. just your looks, your looks. The grain looks darker and a little more consistent than this one does. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't. You know. Um. I think I did look this up actually after she told me that. Uh. But um. I, again, I'm not an expert on the wood. I just know that when I turned it, uh, the the gouge had to be extremely sharp. And even at that, it kept plugging up, you know, where it would build up on the end of the gouge where it's not cutting, you know, uh, it was difficult. And I don't remember that about my wood either. Um, so that's yeah, there's no, something is not there's fitting. No, there's no oil in the wood. You know, there's no resin like in the wood. It's just wood fiber like, which I think is, uh, it, it, it is one of the reasons why it was very difficult to mm. turn. Now, in Mimosa, what I have on my ditch banks that like has a bean pod on it and a very frilly leaf. I think they, they bloom like the orangish pink um, flowers in the spring. Yeah. Well, I, I, or I you don't can, really know. 
Or you mm-hmm. drink it on Sunday mornings when you go to brunch. One yeah, two. that's what I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one I'm more familiar with. <laughs> yeah. I just looked it up, and the silk tree is the same thing as mimosa. Okay. Okay. It's an invasive species here in North mm-hmm. Carolina. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, she um, she she lives not too far from me, and and um, less than a mile away. And uh, she bought the house next door to hers, and and uh, they're fixing it up, and that's where the tree came from. And so I haven't seen that when I went over that the tree was down. So I, I I haven't seen you know anything more than the pieces of wood she gave me. Where is Daniel? Dan. I'm here. That uh, Norm, can you go to the other one first? Sure. Yeah, that's it. Uh, neighbor up in the mountains had an oak tree cut down, and he said, well, just take whatever you want. And uh, the tree cutters had left two burls cut and laying on top of the log, on top of the trunk. So I took them. Uh, was real excited. The, the larger one here. I went ahead and turned it green, turned it to the size that I wanted, the thickness. Uh, the piece on the back side at the top, the rim, uh, that came loose. And so after I finished turning, I taped it to it and was a little frustrated, put it aside for, it probably sat on the shelf for two years. Uh, got up enough nerve to start messing with it filled up some of the voids with uh, five minute epoxy dyed black then to give it some accent i used turquoise stone and uh, just filled some of the smaller voids uh, just to give it color all the way around this uh, void goes all the way through i assume it does it it did and like i said the piece there at the rim uh, broke out completely while i was turning so it's epoxied in place. But I thought it turned out really nice. Uh, sanding was a bear because again, being a burl, it warped in every direction you can imagine. So all the sanding had to be done with a angle drill and three inch disc. Uh, Laid off. <laughs> yes, but I did leave the foot on the, on the piece so I could put it in the chuck and keep it on the lathe and spin it by hand uh, to make it a little easier. Uh, I think turned out okay is the biggest understatement of, of the night. That thing's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, the turquoise <laughs> accent yeah, really turquoise. adds a lot. I really like that. It does. It a lot of the, the black epoxy added to it as well because uh, I was a little worried it would stay dull, but it, uh, Three or yeah, four coats. Uh, uh, boy, drawing a blank here as far as the finish. Water locks. And then uh, I used a uh, Scotch Brite pad to take out the uh, excess and everything. So it, it's sort of a dull finish, but I think it added to it. I like it. Yeah, no, I don't I think, think I like it with a shiny finish. I like it dull like that. It, it did. It turned out really nice with a dull finish. Is the turquoise set in five minute epoxy too, or something different? Uh, I used uh, just the crushed turquoise stone uh, that I got from Craft Supply with CA. With CA. CA. Okay. Right. So it was a. a long finishing process because I had to use the epoxy and sand it down and then come back and fill the smaller voids and uh, with the turquoise. Hmm. May say in the in the text, the description, but I can't see it because everybody's beautiful faces is over top of that. What are the, what are the dimensions? It was Thank about you. eight or nine inches diameter and about uh, Three three and a half inches tall. Yeah, that's, you wrote nine that's incredible. Three. You guys know that this is on Facebook, right? You can go to our Facebook page and see all these. Just I have, but I'm yeah, sitting here right it. here, and I can just ask Dan because that's faster. I think it's. <laughs> I think it's it's incredible. I love it. Yeah. 
You can also yeah. collapse all the faces if you just hit um, the thing. On the yeah, top but then I got to put, I got to reach all the way over to the PC and then I can't see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now you're... If we gave you a diagram with 4,000 numbers and steps, it would be easier for you. Now, now you're telling us how yeah. lazy you are. My, my drink is sitting next to my PC, so I reach there anyway. Right, right. <laughs> Incentive. Alexa, get rid of these guys on my screen so I can see the numbers. Thanks. <laughs> You're a bit tardy keeping up with the rest of this, Michael. Yeah. And this was pearl number two. It was uh, smaller. And when they had cut it off, they it was an odd shape. I didn't know what to do with it. So again, it sat around uh, and dried um, before I messed with it. Then Which after we had... Two, Michael. <laughs> After we had the demonstration on the uh, using burls, uh, I got up enough nerve to start messing with it, looking at the shape and deciding where I could go with it. And you can see the rim had a lot of splits in it at this point. So again, the black epoxy filled that in, gave it a nice smooth rim and did the same thing. There was a large void in the bottom. Uh, I filled with the epoxy. But then I left the other voids on the back side open just to give it that look. And again, the turf stone. You know, like for an entryway, and I don't mean to diminish it by saying a key dish. I don't mean that, but an entry piece on the table in the entry or a jewelry, uh, it's beautiful. Thank you. Really nice. Much, much easier to sand this one with it dry. Yeah. All right, that's, uh, oh, I'm going to close this out. Uh, let's see, last year sometime in one of the Facebook group, groups I follow, somebody was selling redwood burl at no more than a quarter inch thick. Strips, like one and a half inch, no more than a whole bunch of strips, picked them up for like 10 or 20 bucks. It's real pretty stuff. Uh, and actually the natural color, if you look at the second row far right, that's the natural color of these burls which it's pretty, but I have found that when it comes to jewelry, color sells. So yeah. I just tried a whole bunch of different dyes on these pieces. Some of them I haven't quite cleaned up completely. Um, but the funny thing is, is thankfully to, to, to our meeting last week, Jim Duxbury solved the problem I had because in order to turn these, I basically mounted them square, rounded them and gave myself the smallest little footing ledge so that I could put them in a small chuck and, and round the surface. The problem was when I got back to them, I realized that the ledge, the, the foot I created was just a little too deep for the findings. So it was Jim's creation of a sanding holder that allowed me to bring these things down the size so they would fit inside the pieces. Was, I still was gonna lose my fingers. I had to basically, I found a piece of, uh, two by two and turned it out a little, dished it out so that I could hold it onto the sander because even at that size, they're just too small for your fingers to hold on to. You still got fingerprints, huh? I still have fingerprints. Okay. <laughs> well, the trick is to get rid of them then you go do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> and Norm, is that How did a trend? You... What, uh, what kind of dye did you use? Oh, it's just alkaline dyes. Alkaline. Stuff I got on Amazon. How did you hold it in your dish? fixture how did i what how did you hold it in your dished fixture um Just friction or did you double sided no, tape I, actually, I made i made some uh i took some of those uh plastic uh, nova jaws that you can shape and i just created a, a very small opening so that i could squeeze jaws around a half of oh. one inch circle okay. again it was a tiny i had to be a 16th of an inch ledge just enough, it's not a lot of weight, you know, <laughs> it's tiny little things. Just enough ledge for my chuck to hold it. On that one in the very bottom, like, yeah. Did you dye it and then sand away? I tried all, I, I don't even remember. I just kept trying colors one after the other. But you know, you get 20 of them, you just say, well, let's try this, see what you like. Yeah. To be honest, a couple of these actually used markers. Yeah. Oh, wow. I think they came out great. Thank you. They're kind of fun. 
Uh, I, I agree with you. I think the color really sets them off. Uh, the middle one, same, about the same size, but these are actually uh, magnetic eyeglass holders, kits I got from Pen, Pen Supplies. Did it with those. And the next thing I'm going to do with them, I'm just going to make this and make just earrings out of the wood alone. I think, I think it's stable enough to do that. Um, working on small stuff can be really annoying, but if you set time aside and you do it one after the other, it's, it makes sense for me. <laughs> You know, if you do, um, do you have an offset chuck, Norm? Uh, yeah, I have. I and I, I do that with wood, true wood. But the burl yeah. has its own figure going on, so I just don't. And it's small form. Yeah. Uh, but I do that, especially with the um, the Baltic birch dyed pieces with the layers. I get great effect using that with the. Uh, off-center carving because basically you're revealing oh. the different colors every time you add depth yeah 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 i was thinking if you were doing just straight wood you know the pendants and then the off-center just to wrap the the cord around yep that's those and uh speaking of monotony every once in a while you got to do some pens but cody no no nope what is it oh this I is heard. the Baltic birch dyed ah. uh, Cousineau wood product. <laughs> they had a sale on this pattern because it's kind of boring. It looks just like wood. You know, it's brown on brown. Um, but I've used it for pepper mills to decent effect. And I, I discovered that if you cut them down really small, it really makes kind of an interesting looking pen blank. That is cool. Because you get such heavy grain pattern out of the curvature. I, at first glance, I would swear that was Bacote because of the colorations. You know That's why cool. it's not? You know how I can guarantee you it's not Bacote? I would be in the hospital. Oh. oh. <laughs> Severe allergy to Bacote, I discovered. First a skin and now breathing. I can't be in the room when it's being worked on. Mm. Um, same stuff. I had some Coca Bolo and some Baduk and just finishing off that set. Now everything in your shop is red. Yep. No, nah, it was just a little bit of Paduk. I, I, I know everybody complains about that but with Paduk, but I don't know. It's just, to me, it's so beautiful. And now that I yeah. tell people, see that color? It's a beautiful color, and it's not going anywhere. It will be that color forever. Uh, going back to that allergy thing, the, the most of wood is in a family that can generate some uh, allergic reactions from mm. breathing dust. That's why I was at, because I got a piece of monkey pod and it looks a lot like that. And I was outside turning it and I, I, my lungs were just closing up. I had to stop. Mm -hmm. And I have I no, I've had no other allergy, allergic reactions at all. Yeah, I did turn on the dust collector when I was turning it because it was so much dust coming off of it. Um, but I didn't have any allergic reaction to it. It's just, uh, you know, just didn't like the dust. All right. And Very cool. Really nice. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. That was a pretty good show. Nice. I was worried. Nice we, were, we had no photos in on Monday, just like a couple of people. And suddenly everything started <laughs> piling in. Beautiful work. Beautiful work. It Everybody. really was. I think it was phenomenal pieces. <laughs> Even with all like those basket flat. cases. Was, yeah. <laughs> even with that, even with those first four up front. Yeah. <laughs> that platter yeah. is just killer, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Really yeah. Okay, right. the last meeting.